Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. This is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching recordings of this and you would like to participate live and interact and ask questions and throw out some comments, I would love to have you here. Go to DaveLander.com, usually on Thursdays, but I'll go ahead and put that link up on my homepage so you can access it during the week and sign up during the week. And the way it's set up, once again, now we had to put a new link in, but due to a glitch with GoToWebinar, but now it's set up once again for register once, register for one, I should say, you register for all, so you only have to register once. If you did register within the last week or so, then you're good for a while until we have another glitch, but let's hope we don't have one for well, kind of interesting. All these platforms are really getting uh, really getting stress tested in here with all this stay at home stuff. All right. Before I digress too far, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. In fact, that's pretty much a show today. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. And when we get to the live charts, which we will here in just a few minutes, feel free to ask about anything. And also, your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, this is for your benefit. Ask about one at a time and then hit return. So what are we talk about? Well, we're talking about more on navigating a bear market. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up. FYI, I've been doing these bear market updates based on the gravity of the situation. So check those out pretty much on a daily basis on my website. So it's in the actual menu at the top of the screen. Okay, a couple things before we get started. I want to show you things obviously relative to this market, but these things will apply to future markets. And I was thinking as I was going live, this is the same stuff I said last week and week before. And in 2007, in 2008, and in 2000. So basically, for the last 20 something years, pretty much you've been saying the same thing. So I don't want any of this to look like it's in hindsight or pouring salt into wounds. And believe me, I was a lot more. The model portfolio has really done, knock on wood, I wouldn't say fantastic, but pretty amazing. I was showing it yesterday in my stock chart show. And it's up about three quarters of a percent since all this mess began, and that's a pretty good deal. Now, I did get hit a little harder personally because I was very aggressive on the long side, and of course, a lot of that was open profits, but still, it hurts nonetheless. I'm gonna have to pay a lot of taxes on all that. <laughs> if the year would have ended a little bit later, I'd be doing a hell of a lot better, so I don't wanna make it look like I didn't get hit too. But I'm navigating my way through it best I can, and I'm just following the same thing that I did 20 years ago. So again, I want to show you these things, and they will apply to future markets. And that's just in case I get hit by a beer truck, or more likely my wife kills me while we're in quarantine. I think I'm built for this quarantine. I'm really doing well with it because I'm here, as I've been saying quite a bit, 12 hours in front of my screens anyway. It's just another day at the office for me. The other people around me, not so much. So again, it's a fluid situation. Check my website for more on these updates. Now, I said this yesterday. I think it's worth saying again. In trading and in life, it, and I guess because this is my own show here and I'm paying the bills, I could say it shit <laughs> goes south fast. And again, as I said yesterday, if you would have told me a month ago that I'd be stuck at home binge watching a series about a gun-toting redneck on meth with a dyed blonde mullet who's a polygamous homosexual, not that there's anything wrong with that, who runs a zoo with over 200 tigers and is fighting with a murdering, we don't know if she's a murdering biatch just yet, so don't spoil it for me, but uh, she may have buried a husband or two, if you do a little research on that. Crazy Biatch, who has quite a few tigers of her own. All right, one thing I was thinking about before the show today when I, when I woke up early this morning putting the slides together, along the lines of things going south, 
the S&P 500 was swimming along very nicely for quite a while, just kind of gradually working its way higher. As I said recently in one of my columns, one of my bear market updates, is that, and also in the stock chart show yesterday, I think it gave a lot of people a false sense of security, a little bit of that permanent income hypothesis. And the HV is kind of interesting in here. It had about a tenfold increase, and the market, as you know, dropped peak to trough about 35%. Now, for those keeping score, the media calls the bear market 20%. That doesn't matter to me. I don't really care, but. It is what it is. We had this incredible drop in the market, and we also had a 10 times rise in volatility. Now, as I recently said, a family member called me in a panic a week or so ago about her conservative investments, and she had called up the broker and he said, yeah, we'll put you in this managed account. We'll put you in some conservative investments. She's a little bit older and she has some health concerns and she may or may not be able to return to the workforce. So she kind of qualifies, no offense, but she kind of qualifies in a category known as widows and orphans. So one of the things they put her in was a big cap conservative fundamental fund. And that makes a lot of sense. These are well-established companies and they have lots of fundamentals and they have in really good earnings and all these other great things. Well. What happened there was one of these funds lost nearly 50% value, and at the same time, the volatility increased tenfold. Now, I'm using 50-day historical volatility, and without showing you how little I know about statistics, but it's my understanding, and there's a few caveats in here which aren't necessarily true, but assuming a normal distribution, and markets aren't normally distribution distributed, which I'd say. And all things constant, and obviously all things aren't constant. The HV gives you a decent reading on where the market will be within that two-thirds statistical standard deviation type of thing a year from now. Okay. So based on that six or seven or eight percent volatility we had in the overall market, the S P 500 should have been six or seven percent higher this five or six percent whatever in this conservative big cap fund means that this stock or fund should be five percent higher or five percent lower well the point i'm trying to make here is things go south really 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 fast now another example in our portfolio was a real estate fund and it had that low 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 single digit hv kind of just plodding along it's real estate okay it's what could go wrong there? Well, lots can go wrong. So it nearly lost 50% of its value. And the HV here went up 10 times or more too. So it can happen. I saw somebody's post where it said, well, if it wasn't for COVID-19, and I'm like, well, you know, well, if it wasn't for the shooting, the play was actually pretty good. And that's Mary Todd Lincoln. So the why really doesn't matter. What is, is if you bought and hold and held through this mess, you're likely to have a 30 to 40% loss. And I think my whole point about all this is no matter what you're buying, make sure you have a plan for when, not if, things go wrong. As I preach quite often, bad things can happen in any market. And it seems like in more recent times, all of this is exacerbated. I've seen many asset classes lose half of their value over my lifetime, my short time in the markets, seeing the stock market. This will be the third time it loses, hasn't done it yet, but it, it might lose 50% of its value. But I've seen 2000 and 2008, 2009, and then obviously, this mess that we're in now. I don't know who said it first, but it's very true. All asset classes will lose half of their value at some point in your lifetime. So you have to brace for that. You cannot be swayed by the Kool-Aid drinking 
buy and hold people, the asset gatherers are the absolute worst in the world. They drink the Kool-Aid of the firm and they go out, they don't do any, they don't do any portfolio management. They just go out there and grab some assets and they get into a lot of trouble by saying things like, oh, we can't get shaken out. We're in for the long haul. Well, I know I'm going off on a tangent here. I didn't mean to go off one, but the long haul is, so long haul is at least 25 years or more because if you go in and just plot the S&P 500 and go back to, let's say, 1920, there's been times when the market can go 25 years or more without making brand new highs. A lot of people don't believe that because they've been brainwashed from the Kool-Aid drinkers. So a market to recover, as I often say, a lot of these buy and hold metrics, it's like they used to be a guy on the radio. I guess he's still on the radio. I don't listen to him or anything, but somebody emailed me once and said, he says that you could get in mutual funds that pay 12% and implying that it's guaranteed. It's like, well, I think that goes to some of the Greg Morris research where these buy and hold metrics are based on an 81-year time horizon. And as I often joke and have little slides with Sweet Brown pops up, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Speaking of old Abe, I think Abe would have been a pretty good trader. The best thing about the future is that it comes at you one day at a time. And that means in markets that things get bad before they get worse. So again, this is something that I was showing just yesterday. Although things go south fast, usually there are signs and signals at the turn. Things get bad before they get worse. At the most basic level, a market, and I use 10% for the S&P 500, it might be 20% or 30% or more in a volatile stock like a biotech. Unfortunately, right now, everything, fortunately, unfortunately, depends on how you want to look at it, but everything is volatile now. As I'm going through my scans, it's like I've got REITs <laughs> with like 150 HV. I've never seen that in my lifetime. Now, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. One thing that I want to emphasize is that anything can happen. And as soon as you say, wrap your head around the fact that anything can happen, that becomes quite liberating for you. So this stodgy little conservative big cap fundamental fund could and did lose half of its value. The REITs could and did lose 35, 40% of their value, kind of like the S&P just did. The REITs, who are normally pretty boring with a single digit HV, just bore you to death, but they plot along forever and you make a little bit of money in them a long period of time. All of a sudden, that HV skyrockets to 150% or more. So anything could happen. Now, getting back to the S&P 500, as I've been preaching, at the most basic level, if a market's going to lose half of its value, it's going to lose 10% of its value for. And 10% is a good round number in the S&P 500. I can't guarantee you that this will always work. But if you go back to the Great Depression, if you go back to the 70s, if you go back to 1987, if you go back to 2000, if you go back to 2007, early 2008, and of course, this little mess that we just went through, the market lost 10% of its value long before it went on to lose 50% or more. So you can see we did have the little 10% drop back in March. And back then, we had, what, a first thrust down. We had a bow tie down on an hourly basis. As Jim pointed out in the Facebook group, we had a bow tie down in the hourly. Thanks for pointing those things out, Jim, again. And just a plethora of other signals in the 10% TFM system, which to my disbelief or kind of like amaze me is a weekly sell signal triggered before a lot of this daily sell signal stuff began to trigger right around 3000. I think it was in late February triggered. We'll take a look at the, I think the spreadsheet's still in here somewhere. So anyway, things get bad before they get worse. And Charlie Baleo and Michael Gayard, is, as I said recently, from, I got this from a presentation by Arthur Hill, 
which I was part of, the Navigating a Bear Market presentation, they said that bad things happen below the 200 day moving average. Years ago, if we had a, a, a long only system and I was doing the programming on it and they, they, the person who hired me was trying to make it work and I said, does it work? They would say, well, put a moving average in and don't take longs below the 200 day moving average. And believe it or not, many times, just something simple as that would make it work. Now, along those lines, uh, Mr. Baleo and Gayad, as they say, bad things happen below the 200. Well, I think bad things happen below the 10% line. And the 10% line is the 50 week closing high less 10%. Now, I know I've been beating a dead horse on these things, but I think it's worth showing one more time. So, as a good old statement, you want to be long when you're above the 10% line and short when you're below the 10% line. And to those who do have stock charts, we are having these indicators pro programmed in. It's just a little, it's not a, I wouldn't call it an indicator. It's just a statistical measurement of where you are on price. And this 10% line is just 10% below the 50-week closing high. But you can see there's some whipsaw here and there, but your really, really ugly markets happen when you cross below that 10% line. So you better pay attention once a market loses 10%. Again, in case I get hit by a beer truck and get killed by my wife, just remember that in the future. And again, this is the measurement. Somebody was asking about the X scale in here. It's to the right if you squint, squint your eyes. As I have highlighted, that's a 10% line, 20% line, and a 50% line. You could see, again, bad things happen below the 10% line okay not all the time i mean there's going to be some whipsaw here and there but you better make darn sure you're honoring your stops and you're dusting off your books on how to short stocks or reading my articles on how to short stocks and things like that i think i wrote one in 2000 which is in the back of or 1999 1998 maybe even 1995 god i'm showing my age but it's in the back of day landing on swing trading and anybody who wants a copy of that, DaveLander.com slash free book, and you can get all three of my PDFs of my books for free. Obviously, the Great Depression, market down 80% or so, pretty ugly. But long before it dropped 80%, it dropped 10%. And in 2009, we lost half the value. And uh, NASDAQ in 2000 lost 70 six or 74 percent each presentation i add a percent so i guess by next year it's going to be 200 percent of its value <laughs> but i think it's around 73 or 74 percent of its value might even be a little bit bigger than that and again in 2020 the you can see that we dropped 10 percent then we dropped 20 percent and then we dropped over 30 percent and now we're having a little bit of a retrace so those numbers have improved a little bit now, one thing that I've been seeing out there, and they've been using a variety of measurements, I guess average true range would be a good one, and it might be worth studying, but their point is that markets bottom on extreme volatility. And my thinking is they're probably right, but the timing could be a little bit off. And the bottom line with me is, as I've said several weeks ago, I've been saying for several weeks, what's it going to take this market to bottom? Well, it's going to have to stop going down, okay? And that's my Captain Obvious statement. So instead of trying to make it more complex than it has to be, and believe me, if you want to, or, or it, it's fine, go out and do some research with some of these things, such as volatility and I'd kind of caution you know, and oversold because that could get you in a lot of trouble. But if you want to go out and do that, research by all means do it but for me i've been trying to boil down trading over the years to make it more and more simpler and then i think that's why i ended up trademarking trading simplified is that let's just wait until the market starts going up and then we'll decide whether or not it's a bottom as a trend follower as a preach you're going to be a little late for the game so one thing i thought i would play with this morning was 
Let's take a look at HV, which is pretty extreme right now. And you don't have to fully understand volatility in formulas and the logarithmic price change of day over day and whatever all this other garbage is to create this formula. It's kind of like you just, if you need some light, you just flip on the switch. You don't have to know a whole lot about electricity. So just know that this is kind of, uh, it's a great way of looking at beta. If you're looking at how a stock reacts to the overall market, you can look at the volatility. So you look at those REITs a few months ago or a month ago, and they're like, oh, they're like at 6%, and the market's at 10%. So they're less volatile than the overall market. Well, that's all things constant. Obviously, things change quickly. But we could see volatility did peak back in 2008. And if you look at that, that's right about the time the market bottom, right? So we had a bottom in the stock market, a peak in volatility. And right now, we have possibly a peak in volatility and maybe a bottom, right? Well, the world is pretty complicated. First of all, the peak in volatility will be in hindsight. So I, I think the S&P at an HV of 65 is pretty absurd. I think that's pretty high, okay? It seems a little bit overdone. But it was 75 in 2008, and then maybe a little bit higher, about 80 almost, and then that was the peak of volatility. Well, if we look at when that happened and draw a line to the right, the market actually dropped another 27%. And, and, and again, keep in mind that that peak in volatility is in hindsight. So I'm trying to think, initially I wanted to prove how, how off you can be with this type of market timing, but maybe there's a positive spin on it. When you see volatility begin to drop after it's been extreme, then maybe the clock is ticking for the market to bottom out, okay? I don't know. I don't think, the point I was trying to make coming into this presentation is that you can't time off of an indicator like this. Look at it, understand it, see what happened back in the 20s, see what happened back in 1970s when things were really crappy, see what happened in 87 and the, what was it, Asia crisis? What do they call that? The Asian crisis? And now we got the COVID crisis. You know, just take a look at what happened in all these crises. Crises, is that how you say that? Over the years. Anyway, the volatility, yeah, it does peak out before the market bottoms, but those two don't line up and you could be off as much as 27%, obviously, or more. So just be really careful doing those things. Lately, I've been talking about possible scenarios, which comes straight off my cocktail napkin approach. I guess if things weren't so crazy right now, I'd say send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and I'll send you a cocktail napkin. But my theory is thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, hopefully rinse and repeat as a trend follower. And the same thing goes to the downside, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. So we've had the thrust down we've had the pullback, so are we in the next thrust lower? But one thing I was thinking about, and again, thrust, pullback, thrust, that's kind of a perfect scenario I'll have drawn in here. But the reality is a market will do the obvious in the most unobvious manner, and a corollary to that is a market will do what it has to do to fool the most amount of people. Now. The second corollary there, we've actually kind of used, or actually kind of both of them, to our advantage with something like the trend knockout, because the market is obviously headed higher, but then it's a big knockout move to scare people out, to attract some shorts, and then it goes straight back up in an obvious manner. And the predicament of those traders helps to propel your position higher. So I doubt very seriously, based on those two corollaries, which I got from Linda Rasky, FYI, and I asked Linda, and she, she said, ah, I didn't come up with that. It probably got it off the floor somewhere. It's a florism back, back in the day when she was on the floor. So anyway, I think this market will return to its old lows, 
out of this pullback, and that's my whole bread and butter, right? Trade these pullbacks. But I don't think it's going to be a straight line. I think it's going to look something like that, and that curve can be shifted up or down. The bottom line is I don't know what it's going to look like. I also think this market could have a pretty deep retracement higher. Everybody will think everything's fine, and then it could roll right back over. I think it's important that you come up with some scenarios, some conceptually correct scenarios in your mind, so when they begin to play out in the overall market, you kind of have a feel for what's actually happening. And again, the market can do anything it wants, and that's why we, if we knew what the market would do, well, there wouldn't be a market for, for one, but if we knew what the market would do, we wouldn't need money management, we wouldn't need stops, we wouldn't need to take partial profits and all those other good things. So rarely does it play out in a beautiful textbook format. Now again, I've been saying this for a few weeks for the buy and hope crowd. It's like nobody bothers to learn when things are good, okay? And I guess that's just human nature. Permanent income hypothesis kind of creeps in. The market's always going to go up. The market always does go up, right? Well, now after everything blows up, my phone begins to ring, friends and friends and family. My wife calls me the other day, and so and so, one of her friends of a client or whatever, wants to know about the market. And I told her, I said, if only I had a website where I would talk about what i'm seeing in the market that would be that would save me so much hassle okay and the good thing is as one of you guys pointed out i'm saying the same thing now that i said 20 years ago so that was a, one of the biggest compliments i think i've received in quite a while that i am kind of consistent in all this or i think i am at least so nobody calls me until they're down 50%. And that's the problem is the bomb's already blown up. It's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I know I'm beating it in horse because I said this before. I think the only advice I can give you, and I can't give direct advice because I'm not a registered investment advisor. The only thing I can give you is that maybe on these retrace rallies, you might think about selling down to the sleeping level. And one individual I'm thinking about now has some health concerns and close to retirement and probably can't return to the workforce, at least in the foreseeable future. And, and then quite, it might be quite a while. And they had, they had to sell down to the sleeping level. And as I often say, and in my last update I did on my website, quoting Mary McClellan, who was Tom McClellan's mother, late mother, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, which is the example I'm making here, and other people use far more sophisticated methods. A lot of gurus picking bottoms predict early and often. They've been picking bottoms for weeks now. Anyway, long story endless, sell down the sleeping level. And in some of these cases, some of these people, through buying hope, because buying hope has worked pretty damn good over the last, oh, I don't know, nearly 10 years, a lot of what they lost is open profits, so be willing to sell down to sleeping level if that's what you need to do, okay? And that's the argument I always make, and that's why I've come up with stupid little simple trend-following systems and a trend-following mantra, is that you can lose up to half of your account or more with the buy and hold. As long as it comes back, you're fine. It's when it doesn't come back that you're in a lot of trouble. And that's the nearing of retirement. And as often saying, Greg Greg Morris is a similar argument. If you got 10 million in your account, you lose half. Well, you still got five million, you might be able to survive on that. I don't know. It depends on on your psyche and all and your lifestyle. But if you got a million in your account and you lose half, Eh, that's a different scenario and a completely different lifestyle of retirement. As I would say quite a bit, I'm getting I'm still getting emails on on this and just be careful of theme-based investments. Some things that make a lot of sense don't necessarily 
work in the markets. One thing I was thinking about as I'm going live, because I just got an email about a theme-based investment, is that your best theme-based investments occur, or trades, I should say, is when you get into a market and then that theme plays out, but that theme was unknown at the time. Now, I keep using this. It's kind of a crappy example because I just missed it and I actually got stopped out right before it happened. But let's just talk at hypotheticals. And what would the world be without hypothetical questions, right? Spelled with a W. But I was at a little COVID stock. I didn't know it was a COVID stock. This is before the COVID thing hit in earnest. And I got to shake it out, but it went up 50 points over the next few days. Well, I guess it's a bad example because I missed the boat on that. But the theme played out. Now, trying to get into that same stock now would probably be a bad idea. So the theme-based investing is, is very, very, very hard to do. Be careful with value. Had another long-lost relative call me. A couple of weeks ago, I wanted to buy airlines. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And that's like their first trade. And I think that's the same individual I wrote about. In fact, I know as somebody who is buying the market when they have money because they, they have some found money they came into. As I said recently, when it gets we get to this liquidation market that we were in about a week or so ago, it's the baby, the bathwater, and the tub all gets thrown out. And that means that stocks go down, bonds go down, gold goes down, everything goes down in order to raise cash. Uh, shorts are running out of room. In some cases, that's a good problem to have, and we're going to have to reevaluate that. We have some shorts in the portfolio that are approaching single digits, and one of them actually went below double digits. So it's like how much is left and how much is – it's a good problem to have, but we'll have to – Pay attention to that. And flickering ticks, I stole that line from David Keller. I'm not sure where he got it from. But you do have to be careful. And I'm kind of guilty of firing off some day trades, some unnecessary day trades, because I'm getting a little sucked into this. And the volatility is kind of whack. But I've, I've backed off tremendously on that. And if I just can't stand it, I'm taking such a small position in some of these unplanned trades just to get it out of my system. and learn my lesson or relearn my lesson. That's the thing about markets, you have to relearn your lesson quite often. It's the craziest thing, isn't it? If you can't short, what do you do? Learn how to short, okay? Uh, deep in the money puts can work, but right now the volatility is so whack on those things. Even the deep in the money puts, it's gonna be hard to make money on options. I did spend 14 years in a hedge fund that just traded options which pretty much taught me to tread lightly in trading options <laughs> out of, after all those years. But I do have quite a bit on my website in the members area under the Q&A. And, and this is why I created all this learning management system and all these courses and all this stuff that's in the members area. One, in case I get hit by a beer truck or get killed in, in quarantine by my wife. I guess I shouldn't make that joke. <laughs> and two, because it's inefficient for me to teach everybody on a one-on-one -on -one basis over and over. So go through the courses, go through the Q&A, get up to speed. And then if you still have questions, ask questions, we'll cover them in the Q&A. Or ideally, bring them up in the Facebook group and we'll sort it out there. Anyway, a lot of gurus have been picking bottoms, as I've been saying quite a bit. So speaking of the Facebook group, we're not really made to be alone. This is why this quarantine, as some are beginning to fear, is going to have some unintended consequences, unfortunately. And Dr. Robert Mara has done some really good research on this, as I've said in prior weeks. Read the Kaizen Way, which is pretty good. Uh, one of my favorite books from him, but also read Mastering Fear, and he talks about it in there. And he also was speaking at a conference that I was speaking at a few years back, and he talked about the importance of interactions with other human beings. And as my wife has said, 
this Facebook group has been the best thing that I've ever done. It really has been for me. Ask for help, you know, get in a Facebook group, ask for help. If you need help, be prepared to do your homework, okay? If you want to learn how to trade, it's like this long lost relative. I, you know, I'll set her up with all this stuff. She just wants to jump in and start straight. She wants to jump in and buy airlines, you know, three weeks ago, or whatever. It's like, no, that's that's not how it works, Beatrice. That's not how any of this works. You're gonna to have to get educated. So feel free to ask for help. Not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength, but just be ready to do a lot of homework. The other thing that's great about the group is we've got a good group of traders and they're pointing out setups and the trades that they're taking. And in some cases, they'll point out signals in my stuff, which I might not have even noticed myself. So it does help to have an extra set or eye of eyes or an extra dozen or two dozen or three dozen set of eyes. Anyway, I'm also, I also try to throw out something, not that I want to be more active, but every now and then something comes along that might be worthwhile, like ZM trade today, I threw that one out, it worked out, knock on wood, and the opening gap reversals is what I'm referring to, and we talk about those quite often. And the $4 million challenge, which hasn't done so well as of late, and I've been so busy with everything else going on that I've kind of let that die out a little bit, but I do plan on getting back on that. These gurus out there that claim to make all this money, they never tell you ahead of time and show you ahead of time what they're doing. So I figured it'd be fun to do that. Anyway, the Facebook group, 100% free with the big old caveat, right? <laughs> you have to be a gold member of DaveLander.com and that's just to keep the riffraff out. I'm half kidding. So you can go to these URLs to learn more about that. Let me just freeze that screen for a second. All right, let's go to live charts. Do you guys have any, any questions on anything? Feel free to start asking now. Let me just shift gears here. Let's get to the live charts. The market's kind of unfolding and, and kind of, I hate to say this because it sort of sounds smug, but it's kind of doing what it does in a downtrend. It's, it's kind of like it's no longer shocking me or anyone. I mean, I guess it's shocking some other people, but I mean, it never did shock me when we get to fall. I mean, I, of course, I dropped some meth bombs, and I'm I'm gonna have the T-shirt soon. <laughs> who posted that in the group? Was that Jim? No, it was Chris. I forget who, but uh, I immediately ordered one. It's funny as hell. I'll get a picture of me in it soon. But it kind of unfolded in a in a somewhat perfect manner okay it was perfect it was perfect we had a perfect sell-off we had the perfect little pullback we had the perfect signal in the 10 percent system we had the bow ties <laughs> i guess my auto swajadegger has become uh donald trump a rather poor donald trump i might add but we had the thrust down we had the pullback we had the bow tie you know we had the bow tie you can see triggered back here about three thousand a few days or a week or before that triggered, we had the TFM system. And the point I'm trying to make is one, it's kind of unfolding in a normal kind of manner. And things that worked years ago, such as the the bow ties, I don't want to say the TFM 10% system because I, I've all, that's only been published for about two years, I guess. But things that I discovered long before that, such as bow ties in the mid 90s and daylight, even going back further, I think the first public mention of the or Landry light, as we now call it, was in 1995 in an article I wrote for Stocks and Commodities, which you can find online for free, by the way. Just uh, look for 220, 2/20 EMA breakout system, was a little Forex deal that I'd worked on back in the day. Anyway, thrust, pullback, okay, first thrust, whatever you want to call it, bow tie, okay, inverted cup and handle, as I'm seeing it looks like now, and then thrust, then pullback, and then what's the what's the mantra? Thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse, and repeat. Now, again, we've having a, we're having a pretty good day today, okay? That's funny, you know, a pretty good day up 1.78%. 1.77%, 1.76%, 1.75%. Hang on, I gotta go short this market. 1.74%. Okay, back to 1.76%. Okay, point is, 
it's, you know, it's amazing. A two percent day or a one and a three quarters percent day is is nothing anymore. Look at how small that bar is. But it's going to be a bumpy ride lower in most cases, okay? And you know, even though it looks like a route down here, if you were short during some of this, you had some really bad days in between. That reminds me of Livermore. And I wanted to find the exact quote, but basically to paraphrase, he talked about there's been times, and I don't know if he's talking about bear markets or bull markets. I'll have to go dig out my book and look. But he talks about times when he knew he would give up a million dollars or more of open profits but he stayed the course, not because he was obstinate, but because that's the thing to do. And it kind of reminds me on a short side, you know, you come in and you got a day like yesterday and you're just doing really, really good. But believe me, I'm not feeling smug while I'm keeping my head while everybody else is losing theirs, because I know it's going to be my turn in the barrel soon. And that sharp covering rally, that sharp, short covering rally is going to really, really punish me. And we'll suck. And that's why we take partial profits along the way and trail the stops and all those great things we talk about with the money management. Okay, keep the questions coming. And uh, feel free to ask about individual stocks too. All right, now's that composite. A little bit of a bump there too. Again, thrust, pullback. I guess we had a pullback here, like the P's, another thrust, pullback. So the trend follower believes that a market will thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback forever. And then eventually he's wrong. But as I've been saying, he'll be a little late to the party and he'll overstay his welcome a little bit. But if you wait for signs and signals and price action, first and foremost, price action, then you will have a pretty good idea when the market is bottomed. In the meantime, stick with the big blue arrow, which continues to point lower, at least for now. But keep an eye out on the daily moving averages, the bow tie moving averages. Let's take a look at the, and Jim in the Facebook group reminds me to do this. One thing I've been saying is the hourly bow tie would alert us to when the retracement big picture retracement may have begun. And as I've been talking about lately, we did have that hourly bow tie. It was a little sloppy. And look at the presentation on my website on that. Today is the second, so it's it'll be posted on the homepage. And if not, it'll be in the bear market updates if you're watching this after the second. But anyway, it had a little bit of a run from that. Not much to get excited about, but now the hourly has turned back down. And what I was saying is the hourly might give you a good gauge as to when the overall market has turned back down today, notwithstanding. But you can see, okay, well, how do you know thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse and repeat? You know, just for S and Gs, and I have not looked at this chart, so I don't know what it's gonna look like. But let's go back and look at the market on, Three five, and we if we can go back that far on an hourly chart. And again, I really want to thank you guys in a group who are looking at these things on a more micro level. Not that you want to trade on such a micro level, but it does kind of give you a good idea where you are. Yeah, look at that. So in three five, it did bow tie back down to the downside. By the way. As I've been talking about, or as I often preach, if all you did was trade in the direction of the bow tie moving averages, meaning that when they're in downtrend proper order, 10 less than 20 and 20 less than 30, and when they're in uptrend proper order, 10 greater than the 20 and the 20 greater than 30, you would probably do okay. Now, keep in mind, everything works better in trending markets, okay? So you've got downtrend proper order, and what do you have, a nice downtrend there, okay? 10, less than 20, less than 30, okay? 
And then they kind of meander around for a little bit. And then what do you have? You have downtrend proper order, okay? And then you have uptrend proper order. And then now let's zoom it in a little bit and see where we are. This is an hourly chart, okay? And now once again, you have downtrend proper order, okay? Now, this is not to say that it might get choppy, might not get choppy, or might get choppy in between, because it will, but in a trending market, I guess that's a little caveat there, the bow tie moving averages, whether you're looking at an hourly chart or a daily chart or a weekly chart, if you have proper downtrend order, you want to be following the market lower, okay? If you have uptrend proper order, you want to be following the market higher. As I often preach on a weekly basis, major signals can occur to let you know if you're in a major bull market or bear market. And then following the order of those moving averages can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, this last slide happened so fast, these moving averages, even on a daily basis, took a little while to catch up, but hey, you know what? The signal, let's just say the trigger was here to the low, signal to low, 25%. That's not bad, okay? I mean, you catch a 25% mar move in the overall market every now and then, you're doing pretty damn good. Anyway, I kind of beat the dead horse on that. NASDAQ composite, again, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, and looks like we're in that new thrust lower so far, today notwithstanding. Russell 2000 has been looking ugly. Somebody emailed me to thank me to that I've been pointing out from last year and a half that the Russell just didn't look fantastic. I just call him as I see him. You know, I'm not trying to predict. I'm just trying to follow along. Let's take a look at gold while we're here. Gold's kind of all over the place. Like I said, we went into that trend, that um, liquidation market, and gold actually began to implode. Gold doesn't necessarily outperform stocks in a bear market, although the people on TV sure are pumping out the ads. This is this is where those people can really shine and sell a lot of gold at overpriced levels. They mark it up and sell it and fleece the layman. <laughs> Not that that's funny, I'm just, it's it's amusing to me. But I wouldn't buy nor sell gold at this point in time. It's kind of all over the place. But as you can see, it did sell off hard with the overall market. So nothing wrong with owning a little gold. I had some physical silver that I collected long before I was a trader. I remember as a kid, I think I had $10,000 worth when the Hunt Brothers corner of the market i thought i was going to be really rich and then that all came crashing down that was my first lesson in bubbles fell half dave <laughs> note to self anyway gold kind of all over the place i wouldn't rush out and trade it right now i wouldn't necessarily use it as a flight to safety so as you go through these sectors you can see that most of them look like the overall market and and that's the point i think i'm trying to make is that when the shit hits the shit hits the fan everything gets taken out okay again the baby goes out with the bath water but all of these sectors have imploded in here and all of these sectors look like the overall market itself so thrust pullback thrust pullback rinse and repeat and you know, I was looking at transports yesterday, and like, wow, transports have really gotten whacked, but everything has gotten whacked in here, so that's no big shocker. But just for S and G's, let's just see what that is. Round numbers, roughly, yeah, it's forty percent. Not as bad as it looks, right? But still pretty bad nonetheless. And again, everything kind of looks the same right now. And I've got thirty-four lately. I've been having. 3,400, 3,500 or more stocks to sift through on the short side. There's a couple little longs in there, but some of the longs are like SP, XS, and things like that. You know, things that have kind of taken off, looking great. Not so much this one, but looking like nice little pullbacks. And then when I look at what they are, I'm like, oh, it's an inverted bear fund type of thing. All right, let's open up for individual 
stock questions. Chris wants to know about SPSC. Very deep retrace on this one. Yeah, and that's the thing that I've been saying. And I get a lot of questions on first thrust versus pullbacks. And how do you know? Well, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you have a really deep retrace and it can become or turn from a deep pullback into a first thrust. But I don't see myself rushing out to buy any first thrust type of patterns just yet. I would have to agree with you. This looks like a fantastic setup. The one thing that you have to be careful of though, and the reason why you did not see this one on my Landry list is look at the volume. It's 280,000, which isn't horrible for a $50 stock, but as a general statement, you really wanna pay attention to that volume on the short side because if this thing gets squeezed really hard, you could be in a lot of trouble. But yeah, by all means, use a super a super liberal entry should you decide to go after something like this. And that in and of itself might keep you out of a lot of trouble. Race as a short. Yeah, so if this one was a little bit more volume, I'd give you a high five on it, but it's not bad. Race is Ferrari. And let's back the chart out a little bit. Okay, one thing I like on the short sides, I like when stocks are coming off of all-time highs. If you go in and look at the portfolio, PAGS was a short back here, way back here, okay? And we had Tractor Supply was a short way back here, okay? Uh, in more recent times, HEGL was a short right here after the stock came off of all time high so you can you look at all the shorts that i recommended recently big fan of those all time highs on the short side and then some sort of transitional pattern so yeah i think you're on to something with this one it can be a little wide and loose okay i don't want to confuse the issue with facts but i can't imagine that anyone's gonna rush out and buy a Ferrari right now, <laughs> given the nature of the uh, the overall market. I've been to the Ferrari plant and mostly gift shop, I should say. I've also been to the, uh, Emilio Tomasini was really kind. He had me over there to speak once and uh, he took me to uh, Pagani. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, one of the Chris's, I think, is in the race, and with the Pagani, with the Lamborghini, with the Ferrari, we passed by Maserati. It's it's amazing. It's like this one little tiny area in Modena, and all of these companies are right there. The uh, Pagani shop actually, they actually let you go into the floor. It's like they're building go karts, and uh, you can smell the resin in there. They're in there just kind of forming the resin by hand. On these cars and it's just it's little i mean it's like a little shop that that's you know small complex and very very small anyway before that grass too far uh, went on the cotty floor that was kind of fun too for you race fans and motorcycle guys my wife won't let me have a motorcycle but yeah i think this looks pretty good it's um you know it looked a little better a day or two ago but i think it's it, i think it's worth a shot on the short side, Steve. So a uh, good eye on that one. Here's the thing, and I don't want to take away from Steve's pick because it's a good pick, but I have, uh, like I said, 3,500 shorts and a lot of them look kind of like the overall market itself. But no, that's a good looking stock. A little wide and loose longer term. I think it's in a lot of trouble. I certainly would rather be short this than long, for sure. CHDN. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. Uh, you actually, you know, ideally, you you do like these deep pullbacks. So this is a pretty deep pullback. Volatility is a little whack in here. What was Ferrari? Ferrari's only sixty-five. That's that's less than the overall market. How crazy is that? But this CHDN looks pretty good. The volatility usually when something's over a hundred in volatility, I warn people that's a little dangerous. To trade, but everything is so high right now. 
but yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, this kind of has a witch's hat look to it, a witch hat look to it, not exactly the pattern. But what do we have? We got nice, nice persistency, which you normally don't really get on the downside, okay? Meaning that it tends to go down day after day after day, and you could draw a line through nearly all the bars. As I preach mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. So just for S and Gs, let's draw a linear regression line and look at that. Okay, close your eyes and open your eyes. Which one of these is the trend line that I drew, and which one of these is a linear regression line? Okay, they're pretty much the same. So if you're trying to wrap your head around persistency, then play with this little linear regression here, which is available in other chart packages too. But you can see you did have some nice persistency coming into this move, but that all changed really quickly. So yeah, this looks like a shard. It's already sold off fairly hard though. I mean, it's already dropped 17 points from the high. I mean, you probably would be triggering in eh, around 90 something would be, maybe about 90 would be a good trigger on that. But now it's kind of dropped since. But I think it still has a lot, a lot more downside. So put it on your watch list for sure. Chris, good eye on that one. TWM, well, TWM is going to be the inverted shares. I don't like to hold these guys overnight. This is the inverted Russell, and I think it has some leverage to it. But yeah, you know, I mean, this is kind of like asking me about the overall market, okay? Yeah, what do we just say? Thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, and then for the trend follower, I don't want to say hopefully because. I don't want it to go down. I, mean, I don't want this market to implode. I'd rather go up. But as a trader, we have to do what we have to do. You know, it's like a lawyer friend of mine, a uh, very, very serious Christian. You know, I asked him, like, well, what do you do with, you know, maybe some of the things you do as a lawyer aren't necessarily Christian because you might have to defend the bad guy. And he said, well, you know, one for bad guys that wouldn't have a business, you know? So there's so this kind of ethical thing, and I don't want to get too far into that, but we're a trader, we short, okay? That's what we do when markets go down. So there's nothing bad or good about that. It's just what we do, it's how we make money. And believe me, when we have to, we are forced to cover, our buying helps out other people, I'm not trying to justify it. And the thing is, it's like they make it sound they make it sound in the media like we're these evil people. Well, believe me, we'll get our ass handed to a, to us quite often. So Zach, yeah, you know, IWM is uh, TWM is just the opposite of IWM, and draw your big blue arrow. But again, you don't want to hold those things overnight. Ed from the Facebook page is asking about oil. Well, tell Ed to come on over. Oil the ETF. All right, anybody in here can tell me which way this is headed? Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's headed lower, a little bit of a pop in here. That could be a shorting opportunity. Sometimes I look at USO, which looks just the same. Okay. Look at that. HV and oil 103. That's just that's ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, right? So yeah, it could be a short in here. Uh, let it bounce a little bit more, maybe. I mean, I know it's a 20% bounce today, but it still doesn't look like that big of a bounce. But yeah, absolutely. Probably not going to argue with <laughs> shorting things, right? Ring as a short. Well, Steve, it's kind of all over the place, okay? I went long Zoom for a little while this morning, and I think... I try not. I try to avoid the news, but like sometimes in these opening gap reversals, I like to see what the news is. Okay, and I think they said that Ring is going to jump into the Ring when it comes to this telecommuting thing. There's no setup here for me. Okay, so if if you're playing a thrust pullback, the thrust would have to be to new highs followed by a pullback, or you would have to have a long-term bottom in place and a thrust off the lows or something like that. And, and then you start looking at buying stocks or whatever the case may be, play those transitional patterns, play the bow ties to the upside, et cetera. But this is just a V-shaped recovery at high levels, okay? So this is there's no structure here for me. Now, this thing might go on a double or triple from here, but so what? There's no pattern for me. And sometimes you just have to walk away. You can't kiss all the women. Okay. 
ZM long, figure the ZM, ZM long after today's pullback. Um, yeah, it's not bad. You know, you'll this will probably find its way to my Landry list tonight. I'm just not that excited about getting long anything. I mean, today it's kind of exhibit A. This thing just imploded. Okay. And we were I was talking about this one earlier in the Facebook group. I got in at 127, I think. What happened is it gapped lower. So my entry was here above this high. And then as my example of buy and sell for a variety of reasons, I went ahead and bailed out because I had to do this show. I didn't want to have to deal with it. And it looks like I made the right decision on that. But I was I broke my plan. Okay. But I but I bought and sold for a variety of reasons, as Mr. McClellan used to say. It's some people I felt like I needed to put a little money in account, you know. So anyway, I think we're in a market now where it's a little bit harder to hold on for those intraday big trends because they they're not really happening. And uh, I'm just kind of slowly adjusting to all that. And I'm still trying to follow the rules best I can in this opening gap reversal trading. Now, in everything else, in my core methodology, I try not to stray from it at all. And that's why I've been trend following lower and I took partial profits in ACGL. And what's the other one? VLDG, I think. No, BG. BLDR. By the way, the thing about the short side is everything goes at once. You'll notice in today's trading service, I've got three shorts. Okay. I've got orders working on three potential shorts. It's like, Everything just kind of sets up at once on the short side. Long side, as I've been saying quite a bit, you get long a stock, and then you got two or three others you're looking at, or one other one you're looking at, and it triggers, and then you might take partial profits on the first one, and then another one comes along, you might get stopped out of outright loss. It just slowly kind of unfolds, and you just kind of go about your life. On the short side, it's like shit just hits a fan, and it all goes at once. So it's there's a lot of downsides to the short side, and no pun intended. Oh, a lot of downside shorts. I like that. So it's not as easy as I have made it look recently. And believe me, I've gotten my butt handed to me plenty of times on the short side. So uh, ZM in today's after today's pullback, maybe that might make the Landry list. It'll definitely make the Landry list. I don't know if I'm going to go after it. I probably won't. You know, I mean, here's the thing. You're still swimming against the overall tide. And, uh, you know, that could be a theme play, which could be a little dangerous. I know I've been hearing Zoom a lot on TV. That's becoming the new kind of like Xerox. You know, the people Zooming, people Zooming, people using Zoom, working from home. Possible trigger on CHDN. Did we talk about that? CHDN. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that one. Yeah, it looks good. ATHX possible long TKO. Well, I, you know, at first I'm like, well, you know, the volatility is crazy in this, but the volatility is crazy in everything. You know, this thing ran. Let's measure that. Not peak to trough, but close to close is what this thing measures. It ran 200% over short period. I'm not sure why I channel Pee Wee Herman. Ran 200% <laughs> over a short period of time. I wouldn't call this a TKO, believe it or not. You'd actually need a bigger knockout move on that. Um, you know, watch this thing, but just be careful. It's it's just kind of crazy. But yeah, definitely put that on your watch list. Tonight, that's going to come up in my pullback list for sure. But I'd actually like to see more of a knockout move or maybe a pullback over the next few days on that. Probably won't go after it, but never say never. Let's just see how it sets up. But yeah, definitely put that on your watch list for sure. Too volatile. And eh, everything's so volatile right now, Donald. It's like, you know, it doesn't look like electric cardiogram longer term. It looks like it's kind of bottomed out. I bet if you zoom in though and get rid of this recent volatility, it's gonna look a little bit more crazier. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, tread lightly on that one. Let's see how it let's I mean, look at that, 26% down. I think it's going to have to pull back even further. Okay. Hey Dave, I just I am I am on just figured out how to ask a question. Fantastic. Thanks. This is what he said, Dave. What 
to you. What do you think about oil here? I was thinking about taking a shot yesterday and it did not make a new low and I'm now kicking myself, not in a row. Well, yeah, you can ask about things in a seminar. That's fine. Whatever you want to ask about. The uh, oop, I just accidentally deleted. Zach, I deleted whatever you just put in. <laughs> Hopefully, it's something I covered already. Um, you know, I wouldn't try to catch a falling knife, okay? And uh, I mean, I know it's five dollars here. I don't know. Have they? Do they reverse split this thing? How do we show unadjusted for splits? Tools. Uh, show unadjusted for splits. All right, let's just see something here. Yeah, see, they, they reverse split this thing every now and then, okay? So you're thinking, oh, I could buy it at $5. That's got to be a value. That's got to be cheap. Well, every now and then, they reverse split it six for one or whatever. And you know, you buy it for five dollars, you come in, you get all excited, it's at 60 bucks tomorrow. But they divided your shares by about <laughs> 10 or 20 or whatever, and you end up with like four shares at 60 bucks, and you're down a lot of money. So uh, I wouldn't bottom fish in something like this. As usual, follow the plan. Now, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but years ago. I think it was Joe Corona in 2000, late 2000 or whatever, 2001. Joe's a friend of mine. He's uh, He and Saliba wrote a book on options. And uh, he's a good guy. He's a lot of fun to be around. Anyway, he, he pointed out, he wrote a column, options that never expire. Well, if we get into a prolonged bear market, maybe, and I hate to even say this because I'm not going to personally do it, but maybe some of these companies that aren't going to go bankrupt, and how do you know what's not going to go bankrupt, right? That's the problem with these options that never expire. And by options that never expire, I mean, you know, let's say some big stodgy company just gets decimated and is down at $1.50 a share. And, you know, you could say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a quote unquote option that never expires. You could buy it for 150, which would be like the cost of an option, but it never expires. So if we ever get to that point, let's bring it up again. But for now, let's let's not. And I would much rather instead of trying to do that and you know putting it in your portfolio and forgetting about it, why not wait for it to make a bow tie or some sort of Phoenix? strategy looking thing like a first thrust or whatever after a big long base that would be the way to go but let's let's just let's revisit that when we get there and the point reason i'm saying that is this is not necessarily a value because it's this low okay just because it's dark does not mean it can get can't get more dark right all right ed welcome aboard k thanks or is that k or just k like okay okay I have been short S bucks and still like it as a short. I agree. Good job. Yeah, it didn't come quite off of all time highs, but close enough for government work. Okay. Big slide. And yeah, I tend to agree with this one. Um, it's it's gotten a little choppy in here, but you know, below this pivot low would be a good place to short that one. I kind of like shorting real companies meaning that companies that might be priced for perfection like i said i think yesterday a day before that companies that make widgets or produce a product something tangible something not splitting the atom i guess they're splitting the bean here what was that coffee company is lk a coffee company you know <laughs> it happens look at that 72 percent and that's what we were talking about in the facebook group this morning is surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. Well, I'm not splitting the atom, right? So yeah, below yesterday's low, that would be a, a good place to short. And uh, I mean, I hate to give you a high five because all the other shorts that were brought up, I could probably give you a high five, dip the other guys a high five on too, but I, I might have to give you a high five on that one. That looks pretty good. 
Have you ever had an ETF close while you're in it? I can't believe MDZ, MIDZ shut down. No, Zach, because not to pour salt into your wounds, but I trade thicker ETFs as a general statement, especially if it's going to be something in like an inverted or whatever levered share. So it's like that's a tough lesson to learn, but make sure you have plenty of volume in what you're doing from now on. It happens. You know, I mean, that's such a rare thing, though. I shouldn't pick on you because that's such a rare thing for that to happen. You just have some really bad luck. But play the lottery if your luck is that good to have ended up in one. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen there. Now, I have held stocks that become delisted. I think I've got one account of IRA or something somewhere. <laughs> we have like a solar stock about 20-something years ago, and they just have it on the books. But it's the, the money's long gone on that. It was a FOMO trade, lesson learned. Well, good. You know, as long as you learn something experience is what you get right after you need it the most <laughs> you know you know you're learning it's trial by fire and especially in this environment that's one thing that i've been talking about lately especially to my stock charts crowd where i don't where you know this this crowd i can tend to get into a little bit more complex subjects like volatility and hv and things like that but the point i was making to the stock charts crowd is that um and, you know, there's some really smart people there. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't make it sound like one crowd's more than the other. But the obviously, you guys that are here today, more focused because you're in the Facebook group and all, and you're not um, getting started. A lot more newbies over there than over here. I think that's what I'm trying to say, but I'm getting myself in trouble. But the point I was trying to make to them is, borrowing a line from Martha Hill, is it's like trading in a hurricane. It's like going sailing in a hurricane, you know, learning how to trade in a bear market. And and I've had to make some readjustments too, and I've been doing this for a while. But the volatility is just so whack right now; it's it's a crazy environment. So tread lightly if you're new to trading, is what I would recommend. I'm telling you, I never know FOMO could be such a strong emotion when making tra trading decisions. Yeah, FOMO, which is fear of missing out can be a very strong emotion. I mean, I've been sucked into some trades. Don't feel pregnant, you know? Don't feel lonely. I've been sucked into some day trades here and there because I see this little five-minute chart taking off, the SPXS, for instance, and I feel like I have to jump on board. You know, the, the fear of missing out, it's a real big emotion. You, it's like you have to live through all these emotions. I tell everybody, like I was hinting at earlier about, you know, don't start trading now because it's a little crazy, but just Tread lightly if you do and learn. Unfortunately, you're never going to learn if you never trade. So it's a it's a bit of um, a paradox or a dilemma, so to speak. The only way you can learn about psychology is to trade, but you really shouldn't trade until you learn about psychology. You know, so it's a bit of a a paradigm, chicken and the egg thing, right? Um, although, you know, I tell you what I'm going to do later today. I'm going to order a chicken and an egg from Amazon, and I'm going to let you know. Okay. I'm going to let you know to solve that once and for all. But yeah, don't beat yourself up too much. But if you do the same thing again, then then I'll beat you up. <laughs> you know, man didn't, what did uh, Livermore say? If a man didn't make a mistake, he'd own the world in a month. You know, but if he if he didn't learn from his, his mistakes, he would he would never learn a blessed thing. I just think you get caught in bad luck on that one. But the only thing I could point to on that delisted stock that he's talking about, ETF, is that it um, it was a little it was really thin, too thin to trade, I think. Now, if you do have something that has some sort of underlying, what word am I looking for? It derives its value from some sort of underlying. Such as I, I will trade like FNG. I don't know what the volume is, but let's just see FNGD and FNGU. No, the, the volume's pretty good on that FNGU. I think sometimes these can trade a little thinly, but I feel like this is a little thinner. This is the micro index. It's not that thin, but it's a little thinner. But uh, these things are based on an underlying to where the arbitrage will keep them in line. So the point I'm trying to make is with some of these thinner ETFs, you can trade them because they're based on an underlying market, or in this case, markets the fang stock right so 
I'm not as worried about the volume on these as I would be on one of these derivative markets or derivative derivative in some cases. And like the one you were in, which was kind of thin and got delisted. So that's uh, the question. Craig says food is being prioritized. My money is on the egg. Well, chicken's food, buddy. <laughs> chicken is food, you know? Yeah, for the first time in a while, we're starting to miss that country house. We had the chickens, you know, neighbor had a cow. We probably could do a little bartering with him. <laughs> if case the uh, SHTF anymore. Okay, Donna wants to know about OSUR. Yeah, I mean, this thing is uh, Defying Gravity. There's another stock I've been looking at. It looks a lot like this one. I had it in Landry List two days ago. I took it out just because it's kind of crazy. You might hit a little resistance along the way. Volatility is whack, but volatility is whack on everything. You know, maybe on a little bit more pullback, we'll, we can revisit this one. Maybe not that much. Maybe if it pulls back to say below nine or so, but it's just beginning to pull back. But yeah, put that on your watch list. That'll certainly come up in my pullback list tonight, but it's not quite ready. And then again, boy, it's gonna, I'm gonna have a hard time going long anything at this juncture. You know, never say never, but, and even this morning I was like uh, on a day trade, I'm like, eh. I just don't feel like holding anything long right now. You know, what's the big blue arrow doing? It's pointing down. But boy, I'm glad I didn't. I'd, I'd got killed on that ZM. All right, any more questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. While we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Everybody be safe, you know, be be safe and, and stay sane. I'm seeing... People do stupid things still, like I can't say who, I love to say who, to throw them, throw them on, not throw them on the bus, just point them out. But somebody very wealthy I know went to a pool party and it's like, uh, you would think they would know better, but they had a party and just stupid, 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 stupid. All right, going once, going twice. Once again, I wanna thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Everybody hang in there. We'll get through all of this. Any other answer questions, bring them up in the Facebook group. And if you're not a member of that, you can shoot me an email and I'll cover it next week in next week's Week of Charts. God willing, of course. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, everyone.